and welcome to Wallet Pop's Big News Podcast. I'm Andrea Chalupa for WalletPop.com, joined by Bruce Watson. Hello. And Josh Audi, our producer. Hi. And today we are talking about an issue that is at the root of it all when it comes to public policy, reforming health care, everything. And that is financing elections. As we know, the rich have a larger voice when it comes to that because they can give more money. That's what's been proven. So, and we got to fight back the lobbyists. And with us to go over all this is Nick Nyhart, the president and CEO of Public Campaign. Hello, Nick. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Of course. We are we are absolutely thrilled. So it's, it's obvious to anybody who watches the news that with insurance industries trying to control health care reform to even benefit them and not bring about much reform for the patient, it's obvious that lobbyists, special interest money controls Washington. And there's not a lot that our public servants can do about it because to run a successful campaign takes a lot of money. That's the problem in a nutshell. We have a system that involves raising increasing amounts of money or risk losing. And when you look around, where you know who has an interest in giving me more money than an ordinary person can afford? Well, it's the people with moneyed interests before Congress. Didn't the Supreme Court rule that if you have, let's see, corporations can give money just as a single voter can give money, so their, their voices are equal, so one shouldn't be restricted? They, they haven't ruled that yet, but there's a big case that they're expected to decide soon called Citizens United. And in that case, they may rule that corporations essentially are like people and can spend unlimited amounts of money uh, in independent expenditures. It's unlikely that the courts will say a corporation can dip into its treasury uh, to write a candidate an unlimited check, but it's, it's quite likely, or there's a, there's a decent chance that they'll say corporations can spend uh, unlimited money to influence elections through independent expenditures that don't say vote for or vote against a candidate and aren't coordinated, but they'll still be able to uh, pack a wallop. How is that democracy in action? Well, it's not. It's not. When you force candidates to raise increasing amounts of money and you create a dependence on entities with money, whether it's a wealthy individual or, an, or, or a group of organized individuals or a corporation, uh, you really tip the scales uh, in favor of people with deep pockets. And we think that that's no way to run a democracy. It's a, an undemocratic approach to the democratic process. So what can you do <laughs> to change this sort of thing? How can you well, tip the scales the, the other way? There is a policy solution that's already at work in a number of states uh, that essentially turns this on its head, and it says candidates to, will always need money to run their campaigns, but instead of getting a large, uh, large amounts of money from a handful of donors, the idea behind this system uh, is to incentivize getting lots of small checks from a very large number of contributors. Uh, we call it the fair election system. It's also known as clean elections at the state level. And there's a bill in Congress right now, the Fair Elections Now Act, that would institute this system uh, for elections to the U.S. House and Senate. The vote of the rich is stronger than the vote of the poor. That's right. There was the, One of the richest men in the world back in the 1960s, H.L. Hunt, wrote a utopian novel, or it was a utopian from his point of view, and he proposed that wealthy people get twice as many votes as people with less money, and if they want to buy more votes, they can step up to the ballot box, pay cash, and get more votes. And that was a, a seldom-noticed uh, utopian novel of the mid-60s written by uh, a billionaire, but now you almost wonder if we've reached that stage. What would stop a, uh, a company from making multiple donations in the names of several of its employees. There are some times when even in the current system of large checks, money is funneled through uh, acquaintances and office workers, uh, but people wind up going to jail uh, if they're caught. So they're yeah. pretty stiff sanctions. And anyway, they don't need to break the law in order to bundle large amounts of money uh, under, the, under the current system. So uh, I, some people disobey the law, but if you want to move a large amount of money from a wealthy interest into a candidate's uh, election, you can do that without breaking any laws. We think. just saw the most expensive presidential campaign, and obviously in American history, which, which goes without saying, but these, these candidates just tried to outspend each other. And, and Barack Obama, not only did the people vote for him, but we voted with him with our money as well. He got, out, he got overwhelmingly a lot of micro donations from right. 
a huge amount. He raised, the interesting thing is he raised more small donations than anybody ever had in presidential history, but he also raised more large donations than everybody, anybody ever had in presidential history. And he probably wouldn't have won without the small donations, but he certainly wouldn't have won without the big donations either. Right now, it's a big money game, no matter how charismatic the candidate is. How do candidates who take the public funding do on average compared to those that don't? Well, I tell you, where we've seen it at work at the state level, uh, in Connecticut, 80 percent of the lawmakers uh, who sit in office right now use the system to get elected. Uh, we've also seen good results for Arizona, where the legislature has been using it and the governor and other statewide offices have been using it for years, and in Maine. It's not a deterrent. They do well. And, and when you talk to the candidates, they far prefer it because they spend time talking to voters, people in their hometowns, in their districts, instead of going up to the state capitol. Uh, where all the lobbyists hang out and asking the lobbyists for money. You have to have enough money to beat those wealthy interests. So if the public financing system is scant on cash, like the presidential system was uh, in the last election, candidates won't opt in. So you need to have enough money in it so a publicly financed candidate is not at a disadvantage. And Barack Obama in the last campaign looked at the system, the presidential public financing system, that was built in 1974 and said, you know, no, I can't win a 2008 race with a 1974 system, and he opted out. So the biggest danger is a system that doesn't keep up with the times and isn't attractive to candidates who might use it. Will the Fair Election Now Act raise our taxes? It would cost some money, uh, more like 3 to $5.00. Uh, per taxpayer um, that gets worked into the budget. A lot of people uh, think it would also save money uh, because some of the boondoggles that uh, Congress spends money on, weapon systems that the Pentagon doesn't want, might not exist uh, if the special interests in, weren't in there with their campaign contributions. I think you can also look at the tax system, which over the past 10 or 15 years has increasingly reduced rates at the high end uh, while leaving uh, the, the middle income and low income taxpayers uh, uh, with more to pay. So I think if candidates had to listen to the voices of ordinary people to get their money, we'd see some shifting around in economic priorities that would benefit the taxpayers. In any case, the, the cost is very, very small. What are your plans to get this Fair Election Now Act passed? Are you going to reach out to both people on the left and the right? Like, How are you going to harness all this this populist outrage that we're seeing now. Well, I think the fundraising pressure is is reaching the incumbents now, so they're beginning to look for a way out. So you combine the populist anger uh, and the uh, members of Congress wanting a way out. You add in a system that says you don't need to talk to all those lobbyists anymore who are bringing you campaign contributions. Instead, to raise money for your campaign, you need to spend time in your district, spending time in your state talking with ordinary voters. You add that all up, and I think you see a victory. Um, um, that's, that's what's in it, uh, both for members of Congress and for ordinary voters. What worries you about this bill going through the House? What do you think they're going to do to it? They'll get out there and say it's a bad deal. They'll get out there and say it's uh, welfare for politicians. Um, and they'll uh, ignore the fact that it's been a success at the state level. Uh, they'll pretend that the money they bring in uh, has no connection to the votes they're casting. I really see this as like the one thing bringing peace to both sides. Well, I think you're right. When we look at the polling on this, public financing, the kind of law I spoke about, uh, is usually in the high 60s or even in the low 70s in terms of public approval, with a core of about 20 percent against. So there's much more popularity. But in every demographic group, when we look at people by party affiliation, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or independents, a majority support this. But when you look at people's ideology, whether they're liberal or conservative, uh, they also support this, because I think most ordinary people favor the grassroots uh, over the, the, the powerful. One of our uh, early in, uh, inspirations was a civil rights activist who believed very strongly in public financing, and she said uh, public financing is the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. In other words, we now have a vote, but we need to make it worth something. And with an unlevel financial playing field, um, you need public financing to have equality behind that vote. Stay on the line. We're going to close the show. Thank you for listening to Wild Pop's Big News Podcast.